Hello and welcome back to PaleoCast. My name is Dave Marshall and this is a very opportunistic interview on a new technique gaining popularity within paleontology that I got with Dr. Mike Pittman and Tom Kay as they were passing through the University of Bristol just a few days ago. But before we get into the episode, we've got our usual admin to get through. Firstly, the PaleoCast website is back again after being hacked again, so sorry for being absent for a good while, but hopefully that's all behind us now. Secondly, we've got the PaleoCast art competition coming again in the summer, so get thinking about what you might want to be drawing. And for any Paleo merchants out there, this is a huge competition with loads of entries, so please consider donating prizes. Otherwise, any kind of financial donation to our PayPal account will also be channeled into purchasing awards, so thanks in advance to anything anyone can contribute. Thirdly, production of the Virtual Natural History Museum is going well, and we've got half a museum built so far. As part of our provision of educational resources, there's also an opportunity to get involved if you can write some pretty simple software, so please email dave at vnhm.org if interested. We're also close to securing a major feather in our cap regarding contributing institutions, and we'll be making some announcements and providing updates soon. Finally, podcast award season is upon us again, and this year there's been a big rewrite of the rules in our favour. No longer will we be judged on the size of our audience, but by the quality of our show, and we hope that this will give us the edge this year, so we'll let you know when it's time for the public to start voting. So that's enough admin for today. We've got a great interview waiting for you all about an intriguing new method called laser stimulated fluorescence. We discuss how it works, what it reveals and how it's being used. Plus, we've got some brilliant pictures on our website. As always, if you enjoy this episode, please share it on social media and leave us a review on Facebook or iTunes. We're always on the lookout for new episode requests, so please leave us a comment or email in and we'd love to hear from you. In the meantime, I hope you enjoy this episode. So Tom, Mike, thank you for joining us today. Uh, since we've got two interviewees, uh, I think it'd be a good uh, idea to be introduced to each of you separately. So Mike, if you could go first. Uh. Sure. Um, I'm a research assistant professor at the University of Hong Kong, uh, where I lead the Vertebrate Paleontology Laboratory, uh, which focuses on uh, work on dinosaurs in particular, with a, a strong focus on the carnivorous dinosaurs and the origins of birds. And how did you get into all that? Um, well, I, I guess as a kid I used to like a lot of natural history, you know, watch Jurassic Park too many times. Um, but yeah, no, I, I did geology at, uh, as an undergrad because I you know, really like hiking and outdoor stuff, thought I should do that. Um, if I'm going to do that, I want to do that as a career. And then... At university, one of my professors, or two of my professors actually, um, were paleontologists, and, and that actually led me to the realization that I could work in this area, so uh, the rest is history. Great. And Tom, how about yourself? Uh, I'm Tom Kay. I'm the director of the Foundation for Scientific Advancement, a nonprofit organization, and we do research in uh, paleontology, which is uh, my, my, my area. Also do some work in astrophysics, uh, so the two connect through spectroscopy. So I do a lot of analytical work, uh, and that's my focus on both sides. And in paleontology, uh, currently I'm pioneering the use of laser fluorescence to discover things on fossils that we are not able to see normally. So that's where I'm uh, focused. And was it purely an academic path for you to get where you are as well? No, absolutely not, actually. Uh, I was sidetracked very early on in school, although I wanted to be a scientist. I got sidetracked, ended up going into business. I, I had many business ventures over the years, and finally I was able to uh, kind of put the business stuff aside, and now I focus mostly on science. Come on, so what kind of business stuff were you doing? Well, I was in the paintball business for almost 20 years. Very kind of unusual to, business to be in, but uh, got into it very early in the late 80s when it was in, in its infancy, 
and then I rode the wave uh, through the 2000s. So I saw the whole industry kind of come and peak and then fade away. Fortunately, I was able to uh, sell out of the business in around 2005, and that's when I started doing science really seriously full time. That's probably the strangest route into paleontology I think we've ever had on the show. So uh, you win the award on that one. Um, but in general, what are you both doing here in Bristol? Well, we're here to uh, make contact and meet up with um, some collaborators of ours. So we've been working with uh, Jakob Winter and a student, Evan uh, Saida, on some various projects. And uh, I'm actually not here for very long, so we had some meetings with them met up with uh, Professor Benton here. Um, Tom's actually here for a bit longer. He's doing some work with uh, Evan that uh, he might want to elaborate a bit more. Yeah, actually, uh, Evan Saeed and I are working on the ability to manufacture fossils in the laboratory, which is, as much as we know about paleontology, we actually know very little about how fossils form. And we really haven't had a way to reproduce a fossil artificially so we could kind of tell what's going on. So uh, prior to Evan talking to me, uh, there had been a lot of tests done where they took a very small amount of material and put it under very high pressure and high temperature, and that small amount of material would degrade, and they were trying to understand the fossilization process through that. Uh, Through my previous businesses, I do a lot of stuff with high pressure, and temperature is the easy part. So uh, when we got together, I was able to construct a chamber that can hold something larger, something like the foot of a lizard. And then we're able to put it under very high pressure and very high temperature for 24 hours, and that effect manufactures the fossil. Uh, But besides the pressure and the temperature, we also compact it into um, silt and we make a tablet out of it, so it's as if it was encased in rock. So once you split that rock open, we have what really looks like a fossil, but it was manufactured in the lab yesterday. So now we can start answering questions about, you know, what survives, what doesn't, how much temperature and pressure does it take to get to this point, et cetera. And so that's really quite astounding that you're able to create artificial fossils. Do they stand the test of time? Like, is what's left over uh, still just like a a corpse, a, a foot of a lizard? Would that decay in, say, like two or three weeks? Or has that been, you know, like properly fossilized? Will that last and last? No, it's properly fossilized. There's, there's actually uh, no soft tissue left. Everything turns to steam under those pressures and temperatures. So when we open the chamber, steam comes out, and that's where the, the, that's where the, the soft tissue is all about. What's left is, for instance, is impressions of skin uh, in, in the tablet that we compacted it in and the bones. And the bones are brown, and they look just like we dug them up yesterday. So, uh, yeah, no, they're, they're, it's gone and deteriorated and there's not much left except for the remnants, what you find in a real fossil. So just thinking with my business head on now, could you commercialize that and start making artificial fossils? Actually, uh, that was a big, big question. And we we discussed that with various colleagues. And uh, so we thought there would be a problem, especially feathers. We can manufacture a fossil feather now that looks identical to a real fossil feather. You can't tell them apart unless you went in the laboratory and tested them. Uh, So in discussions with other colleagues, most of them felt it would be uh, bad to have, you know, kind of commercialize the idea of manufacturing fossils. We thought it would be a good idea just to give it to the Society of, you know, get a patent on it and give that patent to the Society of Vertebrate Paleontologists. But uh, the the idea was kind of nixed. Sure. I, I kind of worry, though, about if we're able to create artificial fossils, what does that mean for paleontology? in terms of ethics, in terms of, um, like, would anyone perhaps create a, a fossil, on, an artificial fossil on purpose, just to kind of fill in a gap? It, it could be, you know, is there, do you have any reservations about it? Well, certainly. I mean, that, that's why we thought that, you know, maybe a patent was an appropriate uh, out on that, at least to give you some ability to hold that back. It's, it's a problem currently now that we're dealing with already. We have been for the last 10 or 15 years, especially with all uh, the fossils from China. Many of them are composites. Uh, some of them have been put together, and they've gotten very good at that, and it's very hard to tell. It's one of the things our laser fluorescence does. It can point out things where you've got two or three different uh, species that have been put together. We can see that with our other work. So yeah, it's an issue, but it's not a new issue. It's one we've already been dealing with, so I guess we'll just have to keep dealing with it. 
All right, sorry to press you on that. And as you alluded to, uh, you're here to work on some laser stimulated fluorescence. So could you tell us what that is about? Sure, the, the laser acts like a UV. For, for many decades, they've, they've used UV lights that look like fluorescent light bulbs and they shine them on a fossil and often the fossil will glow. Well, uh, I knew about this in the, in the 90s and for instance, mammal teeth glow very well under UV light and you can take a UV light out at night, shine it around in the badlands and you can pick up teeth. Uh, the problem was that dinosaur teeth did not fluoresce and that was the holy grail. You want to find the dinosaur teeth, they're the, they're the cool ones, right? So I was reading about uh, lasers that were being used to fluoresce things in biology, so I tried it uh, on some dinosaur teeth and they fluoresced. So what's happened over the past decade is that lasers have gone from, from red to green to blue to violet and the power has gone up. So at this point we have violet lasers which are just one step away from UV, uh, which are very powerful, and with that much power and that kind of uh, wavelength, we can make things fluoresce that don't normally fluoresce any other way. And that's really the power of laser stimulated fluorescence that we're pioneering here. So would you say that using laser stimulated fluorescence would give you the ability to uh, examine fossils under a new light, so to speak? Yeah, yeah that's exactly it. And I think Mike will, will be telling us here in a minute about the fact that you know up until now we've had m bones to work with and soft tissue preservation was very rare. Well, what we're seeing with the laser is that we're able to stimulate residues of skin and feathers and tissues you know, in these fossils and see them under the laser fluorescence, and nobody knew they were there. So we're making discoveries. It's really a discovery process because it's easy to implement. We can scan lots of fossils at once. We discover things almost every time we go out uh, in the field, like we're in the field now for a month here in Europe and we're going to be going to museums, we expect to make a lot of discoveries of things they didn't know they had in the museums. Okay, but how does it actually work? So we're shining a new light on them, but what is it that fluoresces? What does it pick up that we can't normally see? Well, what happens is when you shine a photon uh, on a mineral, the atoms in the mineral will grab that photon it runs around inside the atomic lattice for a second, actually, you know, picoseconds, and then it comes back out and it's lost some energy. So it goes in blue, but it comes out a different color. It could be orange, could be red, could be green, and that's what causes the fluorescence. So the exact physics of it is, is more complicated than you really want to hear about right now, but it has to do with the minerals and the contaminants in the minerals. A pure mineral does not fluoresce. But when the mineral forms, it incorporates into its crystal lattice contaminants from the surrounding area or the surrounding fossil. And each of these contaminants will create a different color. So if you see different colors, you know that the geochemistry is different there. Now you don't know exactly what is different, you have to go into the lab to do that. But it, it points out uh, things that are different about the fossil geochemically very quickly. Could this be used as a geochemical proxy and by that I mean can you shine a laser at something and everything of this uh, chemistry would glow orange and everything of this chemistry would be a slightly redder tint or something like that? You'd like to think that's the case but the color does not actually tell you anything because there are so many ways for the for the photon to ping pong ball around inside the lattice. So it can ping pong around and come out blue and then it can be almost exactly the same and come out a different color. So color is not as diagnostic as we'd like it to be. Although we generally see some trends, bones generally come out yellows, skins come out generally pink. So we can make some general statements about it, but we can't use it as a diagnostic tool. Sure, and how, how long does this process take? In minutes, hours? 30 seconds. <laughs> yeah, right. Go ahead, Mike, why don't you tell them about it? No, nope, it's very quick. So I, you know, we've scanned, we can scan hundreds of specimens in the museum, you know, get the keys to the, the cabinets as it were, and zoop, scan them, you know, in a day, you can scan hundreds and hundreds. So it's, it's very, very quick. So in collections where, you know, you have open top cabinets, or it's very convenient to take out fossils, you can actually do it super quickly. 
um, you know, you know, for example, in the field, for example, you can, you know, even see stuff, um, you know, immediately. You know. So, do you need any kind of specialist equipment? Do you record it with a camera? Do you have something that automatically flashes the laser over it? No, it's 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 kind of pretty straightforward equipment. Um, you know, Tom's the the kind of developer, the the pioneer of, of, of its use in in uh, paleontology. Um, and you know, I've been along uh, with him on the way, kind of seeing how his different prototypes have emerged. But you know, what we have now uh, is a device, a scanner that's you know the size of an old Walkman. It's you know really small. Uh, you, you can just plug it into the wall. You need a tripod and a camera with a laser blocking filter. You know, it's really straightforward. It's the type of equipment, you know, if you're going to take pictures of specimens, you can fit it in your camera pack. You know, it's really straightforward. And, and you know, because of that, you know, we see it really uh, as something that, you know, should be in the, the upper tray of a toolbox, you know, in your Batman's toolkit. You know, it's something that's, you know, it's, it's too simple. Uh, to set up and use to, 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 to not use it. Uh, about the size of a Walkman. You're really showing your age there, Mike. Come on. <laughs> uh, well, yeah, I don't know. How, how, how big would it be? The size of a... Uh, four or five cigarette packs. Four or five cigarette packs, <laughs> yeah. The size of an... Eye, well, yeah, uh, I don't know. So this episode is actually going out on cassettes as well, if, you, uh, if you'd like to write in. <laughs> send the self-addressed envelope and we'll send you a cassette <laughs> um, a DVD box how about that, a DVD box yeah, that's yeah. A DVD box a DVD box yeah. right, sure, and is this laser dangerous if I was to scan my own face if I shined it in my eyes yeah, you have, you have to be careful with the laser yeah, it's uh, the laser beam itself is, is very dangerous because it can go in your eye what we do is we shine it through a lens that spreads the laser out into a line, mm -hmm. and then we scan the line back and forth over the fossils in a dark room while we're doing a time exposure is exactly how we do it. So, yes, we're, we're careful. We wear laser safety blocking glasses so the laser can't get to our eyes. Uh, the power of the laser is what does it. You know, this is much more powerful than your laser pen, you know, that you use as a pointer in your PowerPoint presentations. So, uh, and that's also what has changed here. So in the last five or six years, five years ago, we were using green lasers, and then blue lasers came out, and we switched to blue lasers, and now these violet lasers have come out, and they, they come out in substantial power now, and they're actually fairly hard to get. They come out of Blu-ray uh, discs is where they originally developed for. So they're, they're not even really, you can't go to the hardware store and buy these things. You have to get them from specialty suppliers, and that's why I build the equipment myself. Well, I think an important thing to add is that, you know, to use the laser, you have to get all the, the relevant you know, permission and stuff. So, you know, to use it, we have to fill out all the, the relevant paperwork and all that kind of stuff. Um, so, yeah, there, there is the, the kind of safety aspect to, 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 to kind of bear in mind um, when we do it. So, Has everyone been open to you using the lasers if you if you call up any given museum and say hey we, we want to come look at your specimens and shine this giant laser at it are they like kind of like yeah sure go for it we'll find extra information or are they like do we need to worry about the specimens or sure. our eyes no, absolutely yeah that was something that was uh, just about to add so the, yeah the, the the integrity of the fossil you know does it after you scan it is it the same afterwards and the answer is yeah basically yes so we're not damaging the fossil um, and that's something, you know, we uh, uh, kind of hammer home, uh, you know, when we do request it that, you know, although, you know, we're, we're relying on the kind of power of the laser, it's, it's not such that it's kind of, you know, burning through it and destroying it. Yeah. The laser is distributed, you know, the laser is distributed. You can put it on your hand, it doesn't hurt your hand. Great. And so what kinds of fossils have you actually studied with this now? Uh, loads. I think in total, I don't know. You can, Tom can correct me, but um, I think we've scanned, you know, probably more than five thousand, thousands and thousands of fossils we've scanned. Um, and you know, as we were mentioning before, you can do it rather quickly if, just to get an idea of what you're seeing. So we can actually defocus the laser, kind of send it out like a torchlight beam. 
um, to kind of very quickly uh, see, look at a fossil and say, oh, does it have anything interesting? And then if it does, we can take the time to kind of use the line lens um, to you know make this time exposure image. Um, so yeah, lots and lots of fossils. So we've done it from all sorts of groups. So from inver invertebrates, invertebrates, and a lot of our work has been at the moment focusing on feathered dinosaurs. So we just had a paper come out fairly recently um, on an early bird-like dinosaur, one of the earliest uh, um, bird-like dinosaurs called Anchionis, which is very important for understanding, you know, what what was going on uh, at the time very close to when we think uh, birds first appeared. Uh, and, you know, using the laser, uh, kind of <laughs> thinking back to when we actually did it and being like, oh my God, that's so cool. Um, you know, we scanned, uh, you know, a, a few hundred uh, Anchiona specimens and managed to find, you know, uh, the soft tissues of the wing, which we call, you know, patagia. It's able to see, like, the outline of the legs and the tail and, you know, come up with the first kind of quantitative outline of one of these bird-like dinosaurs. And for that, for us, that was kind of the LSF, um, you know, coming, you know, coming to the forefront and, and actually moving from something that was a concept with an initial debut paper that showed its great potential to actually showing that, you know, with a quantitative outline, you can actually you know, in these bird-like dinosaurs, what we were able to do is move from um, expectations of what these animals look like, from uh, looking at their bones and comparing them with modern animals, uh, such as, you know, birds and, and crocodilians, to moving to actually being able to say it, see it and saying, oh, actually, you know, these, these traditional ways of comparing animals are, are valid and, and kind of really um, kind of... Uh, uh, making important steps so we're in in that light we're kind of moving ahead um, kind of uh, also scanning other animals and imp important to the uh, origin of birds but we're we know we're also looking at little things so in Bristol uh, we're looking at uh, you know much more primitive vertebrates um, and you know so uh, we're really trying to um, use the laser as a way of uh, you know, filling in in gaps in our knowledge in the fossil records, you know, where we think that you know, the, the hidden information that the laser reveals can, can actually help to, to uh, help. Yeah. So you said that there were hundreds of specimens of Anchionis, yeah. and, I'm, and I'm sure that there have also been hundreds of paleontologists that have also studied them. Yeah. So the laser-stimulated fluorescence, the LSF, was the first time that these details had ever been observed? Well, some of the specimens, you can actually see the soft tissues. So the, in those cases, the laser, you know, made them more vivid and you could, you know, perhaps see, you know, more details. Or, you know, you had something that was equivocal becoming uh, unequivocal, uh, equivocal becoming unequivocal. Um, but then, yeah, a lot of the cases, you, know, you couldn't see it. So when I've, you know, I was working with... Um, Professor Xu Xing and, and, and several other, you know, mainland colleagues. And, you know, when we showed them these images, you know, they're just like, wow, because, you know, you can't see it. And and uh, that's why I really like working with this technique, because it's, you know, you can, you know, we're trained to look at the bones and to compare it with, you know, look at muscles and, uh, you know, body function and living animals. But, like, you know, when it pops out like that, it's kind of like magic. <laughs> so it's quite cool. Um, but, yeah, no, it's... Uh, that's really interesting. So, uh, yeah, like seeing seeing stuff that you know we we um, haven't been able to see otherwise. And have there been any other applications other than just like finding missing details? Yeah, actually, there's there's quite a few other different applications that we're working on. Uh, one of them is we're miniaturizing the laser and a, a video scanning system and putting it on a drone. And one of Mike's colleagues at Hong Kong University runs a department where they, they put things on drones and they run them automatically over the terrain, like mowing the lawn, and they can look for things. So one of the things we want them to do is look for fossils. So we believe we can have a drone flying autonomously at night over the Badlands and maintain an altitude over the ground and mow the lawn back and forth while the blue laser scans the ground. And it can do the job of finding the fossils for us. So we're, uh, we're pretty excited about that. We're looking forward to see how that works out. It sounds kind of a bit like Skynet <laughs> starting. 
I hope so. I hope so. I hope we get a documentary about it. You know? <laughs> but also, doesn't that take away some of the fun of fossil hunting? Or do you think it's more fun hunting for fossils with drones and lasers? Well, looking for fossils is always fun. But I can tell you, having spent a, a lot of my uh, time looking for fossils in the desert, that um, spending weeks and weeks looking for fossils in the baking heat gets old after a little while so I think uh, you know it's always fun doing it but like if there's a way to kind of refine how you're doing it make it more efficient then you know that's cool because you know when you're when you're out there you try what makes you happy is when you find something cool so if you're just wandering aimlessly and you find something you know once every two weeks or once a week or something you know it's it's not it's not as fun as having a drone say, well, oh, actually, there's 10 things that you could find and then going the next day and be like, woohoo! <laughs> so, so I don't know. I think, I think it's actually, no, it's, it's actually good in the sense that it could, it could uh, you know, make, make finding fossils even more fun. So one of the other applications that we have we're also pretty excited about is we have a, what's called a feeder bowl, and you can take very fine gravel from anthills. Ants are known to kind of accumulate gravel on their on their large anthills, and they'll also pick up microfossils and bring them with them to the anthills. So if you scrape off the top of the anthill, you can put it in this feeder bowl, and this feeder bowl will feed it out the gravel in a single file. And what we do is we shine a laser on that single file of gravel, and we look at it with a video camera, and there's a computer that's processing the images, and when there's a fluorescent item in there that's above a certain threshold, we kick it aside, and it's usually a fossil. So what we're able to do here is automatically go through and pick out the fossils from a gravel, which up till now has been a very laborious, very time-consuming thing for uh, usually a grad student to do. And it's just the worst use of time to pick these things out. And we've got a way to automate it. And we think this is actually the first automated machine ever in paleontology. I understand that pain. I spent like five, six years as a micro paleontologist. And a lot of that was spent picking out fossils so if this had been invented by then you know i uh. <laughs> can you see this being applied in the oil industry you know i don't know we we've never we've never talked to those people i guess i don't understand with the forams and things like that that those guys look at it would certainly it picks out shells very easily that you know those things glow like crazy uh so i'm sure it would work uh, it would just be a matter of you know if somebody wants to come up and fund some some work we are happy to do it um, yeah, so we, we actually, I actually used um, LSF with Tom on a new truodontid theropod specimen. So these are uh, carnivorous dinosaurs that are you know sh very closely related to birds, um, and we used it to shine on the tail feathers um, to basically reveal the details um, a bit more clearly. Um, the interest on this specimen is that it's the first truodontid to have asymmetrical feathers and those feathers are the ones that you find in modern birds and are actually also found in the only non-avian uh, gliding uh, dinosaur, uh, Microraptor, a dromaeosaurid, so something related to Velociraptor. Um, so this is kind of a first for the group and what we find in our research is that a feather asymmetry uh, at least in part of the body, um, was ancestral to uh, dromaeosaurids, truodontids, and birds. So that's kind of a major thing. So it kind of is helping to make us, you know, revisit, you know, what, how did asymmetry evolve? You know, what was its initial purpose? Um, we still have a lot of uh, fossil finding to really uh, get a strong hold on it. But it, it, I mean. I, I don't really like to be predictive for the future, but yeah, you know, we might even find that you know asymmetry started off as being you know not aerodynamic related at all to begin with, or you know flight related. But we'll have to see. But that's that's something cool that you know the laser has helped in a you know a very regular anatomical study of a of a new fossil, you know, and you know using it really as you know this top of the toolbox kind of uh, tool. Um, so, you know, it was part of the study, um, but, you know, provides some kind of neat information. So that's kind of what we hope uh, will happen with a lot of future studies is that, you know, when people look at a fossil, describe its anatomy, they should be trying out, you know, with the laser to see if there's any extra information. Um, we certainly got some kind of uh, 
clearer osteological information from using the laser. Um, so it's not just hidden um, soft tissue information that you can get. Have these lasers been produced commercially? I mean, you say it'd be nice to have it as the top of the toolbox, and museums are digitizing their collections all the time. So would they be able to get access to this kind of technology? Yeah, you know, I, since I build the lasers, I've, I've built many of them, and uh, we're working with colleagues now all over the world that we've built lasers for them, and we're in collaborative projects with all of them. So from that standpoint, you know, if you have an interesting collaborative project that you'd like to work on, we could, you know, we could potentially get you a laser. And do you think there are further applications for laser-stimulated fluorescence out there that you've not even thought of yourself? Well, if there's some interesting possibilities. One of the things that we don't talk about too much, uh, because it's rather complicated, is when you shine a laser line on, on a specimen, if you look at that laser line through a prism that spreads the light out into a rainbow, you are actually looking at the spectrum of the mineral fluorescence. And if you scan, scan the line back and forth as we do and you record in video, you're recording the spectra of each specific spot of that fossil. Now, it takes some custom programming, but we can do an analysis of the spectroscopy of that, and we can get uh, further uh, refined information about every part of that fossil. I hesitate to mention this a little bit because we haven't developed this idea very far, but we are, when we go to special fossils like Archaeopteryx, we scan them under multiple wavelengths, and we also scan them with the spectroscopy in mind, so we have the base data. So we expect that the next thing that will happen is we'll do, go out and we'll be scanning using spectroscopic methods, which will give us further detail as to what's causing the color fluorescence. And are there any potential applications outside of paleontology? Oh, funny you should ask that question. So as it turns out, you know, if you go into a cave and you bring a UV light into a cave, you can walk up to one of the cave formations and shine the light on it and it'll glow. So everybody's known about this. It's, it's, not, uh, it's not anything new at all. But you've never been able to make anything glow that's more than about a foot away. Well, now that we have this powerful laser, what we can do is we can shine our laser line into the darkness of the cave, and almost no matter how far away the cave wall is, we can make it fluoresce. So now we're able to do fluorescent panoramic images of the entire cavern and light the whole cavern up. And in essence, the cavern is lighting itself up. And we see all the colors from all the formations over time. Because as time comes along, you'll see a, a single formation starts off one color. And as, it, as, the, as the groundwater changes over time, you can get different banding of color coming out of the single formation. And nobody's ever seen this before. So we're, we're working on these large scale fluorescent comparisons now between caves in southeastern Arizona. And it's really an exciting thing, and it produces spectacular pictures. Can we see these spectacular pictures yet? Uh, we're going to have a publication coming out in uh, the National Speleological Society here next month. The NSS News will be doing a full, full color spread on it, so keep an eye on it for there. So what's next for you guys on this trip? Well, the next stop, I'm actually going up to see some family in Scotland, but... Um... <laughs> <laughs> Tom's in Bristol for a few more days doing some work uh, with uh, Evan and co. Um, and then we're going to go to Italia to see a very, very famous uh, dinosaur fossil, perhaps the heavyweight of all dinosaur fossils, the best preserved of all dinosaur fossils, Scipionix. So it's a really uh, pristinely preserved dinosaur fossil. And it's so well preserved that you can even see details of its intestines and all the kind of fine details of its like internal organs. Um, and I've seen loads of uh, spectacular, you know, spectacularly well preserved fossils. So has Tom, but this one uh, I'm kind of a bit kind of uh, nervous about because it's like you know I've seen lots of images and we're going to try and laser it up, light it up, and see if we can find any more information because that would be even more mind blowing. Um, and then we're going over to Spain to see 
uh, Los Hoyas fossils. So Los Hoyas um, are fossils from the early Cretaceous that are you know, exceptionally well preserved, like the fossils from you know, north, northeastern China. And um, you know, they were, uh, when they were living, you know, were in a different part of the world, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So you know, we want to try out the laser on them to see if we can find out some cool stuff. Um, yeah, we actually had an episode on that, like two or three episodes ago, right. two, uh, two-parter, so everyone's well informed on them already. Oh, nice, nice. Was it about the bird wing or something? I can't remember it. No, it's just an overview of the Lagerstätte. Uh, yeah, so, you know, there's, um, yeah, there's a few hundred f- fossils known in total from that formation, so we're going to hopefully, we'll see how we go, but, you know, given the speed of the technique, well, you know, fingers crossed we can gonna get through a, a big portion of those, see if we can find any new discoveries. And then we're going to Germany um, to look at um, some Solnhofen fossils, uh, as well as some fossils from the Santana Formation of Brazil. Um, so yeah, it should be should should be pretty cool. Um, the the ones from Brazil already have soft tissues, but we're we're gonna see if we can find any finer details uh, amongst them. Just as a general point, I am pretty jealous of you guys. You do seem to get around quite a lot. Is it is it pretty nice working on this kind of stuff? Well, you know, the, the collaboration between uh, Mike and I has has worked out spectacularly well because you know he can target these places and he, he gets us access. So he opens the door and I come barreling through with all the technology. You know? So uh, it's been really, really exciting. And you know, discovery is really what it's all about. That's why you get into science. You know? if, if we knew what we were doing, we wouldn't call it research, right? So uh, we, we, the idea of being able to go out with Mike and every time we go somewhere, we make a discovery. You know? And it's an exciting discovery. Uh, it's really a, a super driver for science, and I and I hope that people can share that with us. You know, we're on Facebook. If you come find me on Facebook, we're blogging every day uh, on these trips. And if if you miss our our trip currently, you can go back in in my history and see it. It's Tom dot K K A Y E dot thirty four is my Facebook address, and uh, w- you know you can see what's going on. You can share in the adventure. And it's been a hell of an adventure, and we don't expect it to stop. But we hope to see you next time we come through Bristol and give you a whole new update. Yeah, I look forward to that. So thanks very much for joining us today. No problem. Thank you. Paleocast was brought to you by Dave Marshall with Joe Keating, Laura Sol, Liz Martin Silverstone, and Caitlin Colary, who was made possible by funding from the Paleontological Society and the Paleontological Association. But the show now relies on contributions from you, the listeners. If you've liked this episode, please consider donating, and thanks to everyone that's helped out so far. We'd also like to thank the Ocean Collective for use of their music. Please visit paleocast.com for the supplementary material to this episode and for our archive of past programmes. Subscribe to our Twitter feed at Paleocast and like us at facebook.com forward slash Paleocast to get all the latest news.